Good evening. Buenas noches. Bienvenido al America Society, Council of the Americas. Tonight, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you all to the America Society for the launch of Fernando Botero's book, Circus Paintings and Works on Paper. Senor Botero, we are so honored to welcome you back to our home, we hope your home, and have your wife, Sophia, later this evening with us as well. We are also delighted to be joined by Gina Tarver, Assistant Professor of Art History at Texas State University, who will be interviewing Senor Botero. We look forward to their conversation and to hearing about this important and beautiful new publication. And I also want to welcome everyone that is tuning in on webcast. Senor Botero, we are webcasting this, and it is available live on our um, on as-coa.org, and it will also be available live for anyone that tunes in for the next several weeks. Senor Botero is a living legend. The America Society is honored that his extraordinary career has included a long history with our institution, and in fact, outside of my office is one of his works, which he generously donated to us um, several years ago. In the spring of 1969, he presented his first solo exhibition in New York, comprised of oil paintings, charcoal drawings, and pastels, right in our own gallery downstairs. And if you look at the screen, you'll see the photos of the maestro, David Rockefeller, our founder and honorary chairman, and Ambassador George Landau, former America Society Council of the Americas president, at a dinner where the America Society honored Senor Botero in 1988. So it is so exciting to have him join us once again and to be able to share this evening with all of you here present and all of you on webcast. With that, I would like to invite forward, you're already here, Senor Botero and Gina. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to start thanking the American Society for this invitation to be here tonight and uh, for the occasion with the publication of the Circus book. You know, and to thank uh, Marta Hallett, the editor of Literati and the staff of the Literati company for this uh, wonderful book that they did with so carefully, with such a beautiful reproduction, so exact to the originals, and for the elegance of the layout, etc. You know, it has been a pleasure for me to see this book that reproduced every single drawing and painting I did on that subject. Thank you so much. Good evening. I also wanted to thank the America Society for hosting this event, for inviting me here. It's a great honor to speak with Maestro Botero. And thank you for sharing your time with us. I, I have a little introduction before yes, I ask sir. questions. Fernando Botero, the artist, like the figures he paints, is monumental. His oeuvre consists of more than 3,000 paintings and 300 sculptures which can be seen in museums, galleries, and public places all over the world. That's not even to mention the reproductions of his work. I personally have seen his posters of his paintings in restaurants from Austin, Texas to Madrid, um, and all over towns and cities in his native Colombia. These are clear signs of his worldwide popularity. His work sell for millions of dollars, and his generosity in donating his own collection of modern art and of his own work to the people of Colombia is magnificent. Even, even the story of how Senor Botero became an artist is somewhat legendary now. How his father died when he was four, leaving his family in difficult circumstances. How he sold his first drawing of a bullfight at the age of 15. How he won second prize for painting at the Colombian National Salon when he was only 19 years old. 
and with the prize money went on a grand tour of Europe where he studied old masters and discovered Quattrocento frescoes. And how, living in Mexico City in 1956, while sketching a mandolin, he drew a disproportionately small sound hole, revealing a powerful plastic world of exaggerated volume that would become the hallmark of his style. So I hope you all will uh, join me in welcoming back the legendary Fernando Botero to the America Society as we launch his new catalog. So the circus that you've painted was inspired by a small, as you describe it, rather poor circus that you witnessed in Mexico in 2006. And I, I find it to be a perfect theme for your painting, not just in formal terms, because circuses are, are very colorful and offer a variety of dynamic poses, um, and not just because the circus has been a theme that's been treated by many modern masters, such as Degas, Picasso, and Calder, to name just three, but it seems to me to also fit with your previous body of work um, because it represents something that's very vivid, that's a living tradition, um, a continuing tradition, and yet at the same time, it has an aspect of um, the melancholic and the old fashions. And I was wondering, do you consider yourself to be a nostalgic painter? Well, no, <laughs> no, not at all, the contrary. You know, the, the circus was attracted to me because first of all, there was a great tradition, like you said, of painting based on the, on the subject. There was, of course, the, the circus, as we know today, was discovered in the 19th century, because before it was the jugglers in the street. But you know, the idea of the tent, uh, then it became like a subject matter for the painters. Uh, then you see, it was the, like you said, Degas, Lautrec, Toulouse, uh, Picasso, Chagall, etc. You know, it's a subject matter that is very attractive, and it is a certain melancholy because these people are special. They are nomads. They live in a difficult way. You know, they have living trailers, and they have a very uncertain uh, life. You see, uh, they always say people that they always say this thing that there is something very sad about the clown. Well, I don't think I think this is exact. Perhaps there are some clowns that are happy, but anyway. The circus is a, an adventure for the people that, that do this. It's an adventure. Uh, in my paintings, you know, uh, I don't like the expressions of joy or sadness when I do a face. You know, there is always, at, at least I try to do an, an expressive expression. Like I see, for instance, in Egyptian art, you know, in Egyptian art, the, sculpt, the, the pieces that never look at you. They look at the empty space because they like the slightest strabisme that make them focus outside your face and outside everything. You know, then, you know, I try to do this kind of expression in my paintings. Perhaps that's what looks like melancholic, but I am a, I'm not a melancholic person. I, 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 I am very positive, but rather optimistic person, and, and it, it, I hope it shows in my work in the color and the abundance of the composition, etc. It's interesting to me because despite the fact that um, people relate so emotionally and so strongly to your work, a lot of the works seem to be set in, in a past. In, in particular, they, they do, a lot of them allude to 1940s Medellin, uh, the, your, the past of your childhood. Well, you know, uh, yes, you know, there are, uh, in Colombia, there have been problems, uh, like everywhere else, perhaps more serious. When I did paintings about the, the violence in Colombia, the drug problem, you know, I, I tried to, to do something to, sometimes that are a commentary about the situation. I did about torture in Abu Ghraib, and I did about the, the death of Christ. I did, but so many times it's, it's a melancholic or, or sad subject. Other times, I, it's like a celebration of the beauty of being alive, etc. And somebody told me, are you going to, to paint the piece of Colombia where we, where we will arrive to have it? I said, I have been doing this all my life, you know, because I, I believe in this importance of, of, of speaking directly, of showing a, a positive aspect of life. I think art should give pleasure. 
I am convinced of that. At least that's what was said by the great artists. For instance, uh, Poussin, the great paint, French painter of the 17th century, said the, the purpose of art is to give pleasure. And I still believe in that. And the Impressionist did it. You never saw a sad painting in, 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 in Impressionism. And they are sure they have hard lives. They have perhaps people dead, very close to them, and did that. But you never know. You see always this joy of the color, joy of the light, joy of the subject matter. You see, and well, that I have been, well, all kind of things, and reflecting the sadness of some situation, at the same time reflecting like a celebration of life. Thank you. I, I've, obviously, you frequently depicted popular subjects in your paintings, but transforming them into fine art. In fact, I think you were one of the first artists in Colombia to, to take on popular themes. And I've got a slide here of a painting from 1959, the Apotheosis of Ramon Hoyos, a, a famous popular uh, cyclist. Um, and I, I know that even in the early 1960s, some critics even compared your art to pop art because of this relationship with the popular. Well, actually, actually I did this before. Well, the, the pop art has, was known in, in New York in 1962 mm -hmm. in an exhibition, famous youth. I did Sidney Janis on 57th Street. I did subjects that were pop uh, year before, you know, because, for instance, I took uh, a famous uh, bicycle rider in Colombia, Dr. Ramon Hoyos, and I did a very large painting of three meters celebrating his victory, you know. That was the revolutionary at that time to take a cyclist, a uh, bicycle yeah. rider, and doing a huge painting about him. Also, there was a crime, very famous crime, of a lawyer that used to kill widows, and uh, to take them to the mountains, kill them. Well, you know, anyway, I did a series of painting based on, the, on these crimes of the Dr. Mata was called. You know, I took subjects like this, uh, the crimes and things in the 60s, you know, in the 50s. Mm -hmm. It was in the, before, I was taking subjects that were not considered worth, worth of art. You know, the, subjects that were not uh, as dignified, let's mm -hmm. say. But I did it, and well, in a way that was pop, in a way, yes. Like the Americans did uh, also here in, 1962, all these famous artists. Yeah. As you say, that was very, very different, very radical at the time. What was the reaction to that like in Well, uh, Well, the, the reaction was kind of, of, of positive. Yeah, I, I think uh, they, they, were, they were related. They were related to what I did. Yeah. Perhaps it was because it was the reality of Colombia that people appreciated. Yeah. So do you? see a real, any kind of relationship between your work and, and kitsch? Because I think that's one of the... Well, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, it almost touch, you know, you, you have to take some subjects that are kitsch, and then you transform this to a style and quality and composition and knowledge into something art, something artistic, yeah? but it's, you can do anything if you, if you know the, the rules of the art, or, or, but not the rules, if you have the feeling of the art, because there is, in the art there shouldn't be rules. But anyway, you can make noble and artistic something that is not noble and artistic, like they did in the pop art here. Some events, like your visit to the circus in Mexico, have, have apparently had a very deep resonance with you so that you've painted them, as you describe it, obsessively um, until you feel emptied of them. Um, and I think something similar happened with your Abu Ghraib series paintings, although those emerged from very different emotions, emotions of, of outrage and disgust. Um, and those paintings have fascinated many, many critics and historians, including myself, because they are, they are such a horrific theme and yet you're known as an artist who, who paints in this style that embraces, as you said, the, the sensuality of life, the joy of life. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you reconcile well, the, uh, those two? <laughs> well, you know, I, of course I kept the same style, you know, because you, you always have to, because you're working on something dramatic, you shouldn't change the style, you know. You have to, at the end, at the very end, the a subject is a pretext to paint. You see, and then you start doing something dramatic, and then it, is, it comes your, your feeling about forms and color, etc., should be there the same. In the case of Abu, Abu Ghraib, it was something that many people in the world 
were revolted of this situation, in which the Americans were torturing people in the same prison that was uh, Saddam Hussein. You see, then it was something that most people, that most many Americans and all over the world, were a reaction. I was reading the articles in the newspapers about the situation, and then at that moment I started imagining how was this in, in the prison, uh, doing some sketches and then paintings, and for 14 months I worked exclusively in this subject. And it's something that, uh, that it was like a relief to say, to do this. And uh, of course it was not the first time I did something dramatic, because I did, about violence in Colombia, I did also a series of paintings that was also very touching for me. You know, I was, it's so sad that, that the, my country lives through this problem of the drugs and the, the violence, etc. And then I wanted to express that. And, uh, well, you know, every time I am uh, involved with something, I have to do something, I have to do some paintings, because that's my way to say things. And in this case, uh, Abu Ghraib or violence in Colombia, it was done because I needed to do it. It was a necessity, and it seems that painting for you is a, a necessity too. You well, yeah, it was uh, unexpected, yes, because yeah. uh, as a matter of fact, I said before, I believe very strongly about giving pleasure with, and mostly part of the pleasure of painting, of course, the subject matter, you know, when Titian paints these famous odaliscas or, or women magnificent, you know, the, of course, it's, it's, there is a voluptuosity, a beauty, uh, the face, the, the, all, all the atmosphere of the, the mythological atmosphere of the painting, is a pleasure, mm -hmm. you see. Then it is, uh, it is so many, Paintings were done uh, with this feeling of, of, of giving joy. You know, you see, for instance, Botticelli, the Primavera, the, the birth of Venus, the, all of these were created by, to give joy, to give pleasure. And many art, most art today, most art in the art history were done with that purpose, you know. It's very different. The dramatic paintings are the exception, but the, the painting with attractive soldiers were the rule. Well, as we said before, the Impressionists were done, every painting was done with the idea of giving pleasure. Giving pleasure. And I wonder if it's the contrast then between, I mean, because your paintings had a, a Abu Ghraib had an impact that went far beyond other artists who treated the same subject. Just as an example, Richard Serra did a, did a piece on the torture of Abu Ghraib, but none, well, none of the other artists. Well, created. you know, the, the case of Serra, I'm sure it's only the title, yeah. because of course, you know, I was surprised not, that not, not a single American artist did something about a subject that was very important. And, uh, but anyway, uh, in the case of, of Serra, uh, the, the only thing that you, if you see this culture, don't, don't tell you that this Abu Ghraib will never know. That is easy to put a name. Uh, so many artists, abstract artists, put the names uh, that gave you the the idea of that something on going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Motherwell put uh, homage to the uh, Spanish Revolution. See three touches of color in the canvas, but I don't believe in that. I believe if you are going to say something, you say it clearly, not just the title. You see, it's too easy. Yeah, and in. Do you think that's why yours caused um, oh, my, so my, much my, more my paintings are My paintings are direct and clear. Yeah. You know, in the case of Abu Ghraib, or in the case of Colombia, and in the case of, of the joy that I try to communicate, they are clear. You know, that's why my, my paintings uh, communicate with many people at all levels of society and culture. And this gives me a great satisfaction. You know, that some, some museum director invited me to an exhibition, but at the same time, a very humble uh, man in the street approached me and said, I love your work. You see, this is it's, it's very touching for me and very gratifying to, to have this reaction of, uh, that is, uh, is uh, at of many levels of society. Mm -hmm. um, the famous Peruvian novelist Mario Vargas Llosa wrote that your art is unequivocally Latin American. Do you, do you agree with that? And what aspects of your art do you see as being? Well, you know, uh, yeah, well, you know, the, I consider my, my, my work very Latin American, and I'm proud of that. First of all, because I, I think, I admire, I, I have looked very much, looked very much the pre-Columbian art. Mm -hmm. 
And that's one of my great interests. Then for every time you love something, somehow it shows in what you do. I love the folk art of Latin America also. I love the tradition of the, what they call the colonial art of Latin America. But all these things that I love, of course I love Italian art and French art and so many other things. But, but anyway, this, this base that of what you, what things that you saw when you were a child, it stays in your mind and somehow uh, marks your production. And uh, in my case, you know, I am Latin American, and the subject matter many times was Latin American. People from Colombia, from Beijing, the, the Beijing that I knew as a young man, as, as a child. Then it was so many times, you know, the subject matter of an artist is this kind of a nostalgic touch. I know that it was difficult to be a painter in Colombia when you when you started out as a painter, and I read that your own mother predicted that you would starve to death. <laughs> well, yeah, in Colombia it was uh, very difficult at that time, you know, because there was no galleries, no museums, no collectors, no collectors, nothing. You know, the, the, the people that I knew that were painting were surviving, being teachers in the elementary school, teachers of drawing to little kids. You know, that was the, the future for, for an artist at that time in Colombia. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I started painting at 15, when I was 15, I was so I'm taken by this, such, such a, I, I enjoy so much doing this that I didn't care if it was that I have to be a teacher in elementary school. I, I told my mother, I want to be a painter. I said, okay, you are going to die of hunger? Be a painter, and then I did that. I was uh, painting all the time, and I have been doing that for 65 years, uh, every day. I think we're very, very happy that you have been. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm lucky that I didn't have to do anything else, you know. I always managed to, to paint, only to paint. Only to paint. Mm -hmm. um, when you began, you were, as we talked a little bit about it, what you were doing was very different, very radical. And I think also not only were you one of the first to treat popular subjects, but you, I think, were one of the first to, to paint religious subjects in a way that was not necessarily religious. And I wonder what the reaction was like about that, particularly give in Medellin, where it's very conservative, very Catholic. Well, well, no, you know, the, well, first of all, first of all, when I did this painting, I was really out of Medellin. Uh -huh. But uh, let's say, no, people, they didn't interfere with, 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 with what I did. They, I think perhaps they found art so inoffensive that we could care less one way or the other. Uh. Then you see, I did my religious painting mostly in Europe later or in New York. I did the Madonna of New York, right. uh, Nuestra Señora. You have that one, uh, Our Lady of New York. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that I painted this in, in, when I was here already in, in the 60s. Anyway, uh, the subject matter of saints and it is part of the tradition of the colonial art. That's why, well, uh, there is some colonial feeling in this painting, very Baroque. Anyway, it was uh, always, I have been always feeling for so many things that are Latin American. Wonderful. I think I just have one more question for you and then maybe the audience has a few. Um, I know that there have been critics, well, there have been critics like Marta Traba who praised you for, for your indifference to the New York art scene. In 1969, she wrote an article and she praised your indifference. She praised your highly personal vision and your commitment to a disciplined aesthetic. Um, at the same time, she wrote that, that it might lead, your systematic treatment of form might lead to what she said, a loss of contact with the exterior. Um, or a withdrawal into what she referred to as the Botero matrix. And more recently, there have been some very famous art historians, um, for example, Rosalind Krauss, who have dismissed your work as having nothing at all to do with contemporary art. Do you, do you believe that's true? What do you think of those critiques? Well, I'll tell you, I, I have had all kind of criticism, sometimes positive, so negative, and uh, it doesn't touch me, I must say. Uh, absolutely, I I am this this critic of my work, very very hard critic of my own work. I discard many of my drawings and paintings, and and uh, I criticize all the time and try to look what is wrong. You know, I cannot see the thing from from the point of view of the others, because 
Most people, more architects, has already a, a position in which they, they judge from their point of view. You see, then it's, it's very, very unfair or very imprecise, this kind of, of judgment. Then I prefer to criticize myself. Uh, I try to be as construct, construct, constructive as possible uh, and very hard. And well, you know, I don't pay too much attention. The truth is too much attention. Well, I think, is it time to ask the audience for some questions? Okay. So um, is there anyone in the audience who would like to ask Maestro Botero a question? Gina, could you repeat the question? Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Maestro Botero. Uh, I just returned from a trip to Italy, and I went to the Venice Biennale. And I, as you know, I am a, also a, a painter, and uh, I agree totally with you about uh, making art that is a pleasure to look at. But when you go to these biennales and you go to the art fairs, like the armory, you see all this art now that is not aesthetic, it's not, it's not nice to look at, it's aggressive, it's anti-aesthetic, it's even gross and aggressive. I mean, it's like, what, what do you think of this type of art? So the question is, what do you think about this type of contemporary art that is not aesthetic, that is even... Well, I, I'm not connected. First of all, uh, you know, there is the fact that it's not permanent. Uh, that is one of these uh, art that is uh, just to discard or, or this discard by itself, you know, because the materials and everything. And then the idea of art as something permanent is important to me. Then second, you know, uh, the art that is an explanation. I don't think art should be this impression. You know, when you see a Botticelli or a Vermeer, you don't need anybody next to you explaining why this is important, why it means. Then, you know, this doesn't have to do with, with what is the essence of art. You know, the, the art should speak directly. Then, you know, there is the, the well, you know, pardon, I was going to say something. It was, uh, uh, you know, I, I completely disagree with, with the conception of the art today. Completely disagree. I have my, my ideas <laughs> and I do my work based on what I believe is art. But uh, there is something, so many things that are wrong with, with the art today. Uh, and that's why I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care about what is going today. <coughs> Maestro Botero, eh, ¿existe algún tema que usted haya querido explorar en su pintura que no ha podido explorar porque es muy difícil, intrincado o complicado y usted no ha podido con el tema, como ha ocurrido <laughs> en la historia de la pintura? No, I, I tried to paint, uh, everything that I tried to paint, I, I did more or less did it. You know, there are, in, in painting, there are no subject matter that you cannot paint. You know, you, you paint it badly or better or perfect, but you know, there's nothing that you cannot paint. Actually, you can, you know, I, everything that I tried to paint, I did it. I don't know if it is, I did a good work or not, I'm not to judge it. But anyway, it's not a subject matter that is impossible. No, I never found that experience. I apologize, I, I didn't do my job. The question was, is there a subject matter that, um, Senor Botero tried to paint and wasn't able to paint. Yes. Have you considered over the years? Ladies, not your company to microphone. Have you considered over the years changing your style, which is quite consistent for such a long period of time? Well, what happened is this: you know, the most people after Picasso, uh, they think that an artist should change his style every six months. Um, I don't agree with that because. All the artists that I've met in my, in my life has had a style because it's his identity. You know, you see everybody, Botticelli, Piero della Francesca, Vermeer, Velázquez, all these have the same style from the angles, from the beginning to the end. You know, because this, this style is a result of the conviction, you know. The style is, is your identity because you believe something then what you believe shows in the automatically in your, what you do. Let's say you have to change your set of ideas about art in order to change. If I continue to believe what I believe, it will be the same. 
But anyway, uh, the, the art, the history of art is the history of the people that have the style. Everybody of the great artists that we know, Rembrandt has the, the style of Rembrandt, the Botticelli, the style of Botticelli, and everything like this, you know. This is the exception, you know, because of Picasso and because of the black paintings of Goya, perhaps that they did in the last months of his life. They don't, but anyway, artists has convictions. And then once you have a conviction, you have an identity, you, have a, you produce something that is marred by this conviction. Then, you know, if you, if you don't have any conviction, and many artists today, they try this, they try this, tried so many things, but, you know, it's, that, that's not the thing. It was proved, you know, it has been proved with art history that the style is the thing. Have you ever felt like a painter out of time? Like, have you ever <laughs> felt you were more like the Quattrocento than? No, 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 I'm very happy now. <laughs> <laughs> Bueno, pues primero que todo es un honor para mí, yo también soy colombiana, estar en el mismo salón con una figura tan importante para Colombia y alguien que le ha dado esperanza. Pues para mí la, el arte del de señor Botero lo veo desde que nací y ha sido parte de mí, de mi historia y pues por eso quería agradecerles y siento que le ha dado mucha esperanza a muchos colombianos des, por muchísimos años y de verdad es todo un honor tener a alguien al frente que ha mostrado que en Colombia podemos producir cosas muy buenas para el mundo. Mi pregunta es, ¿cómo siente usted que su arte también ha influenciado la vida de personas como yo y familias en Colombia? Y si, uh -huh. y si, si, pues, si cuando pinta, de pronto eso es algo que pasa por su mente. The, um, I, I really can't translate exactly oh. what she said because it was very beautiful. She was talking about how important El Maestro Botero is for Colombians to have someone, um, a major figure who shows that Colombians can do something very well. And she's asking if it ever goes through your mind how, how important you are to Colombians <laughs> and how many people's lives you're touching well, well, with your well, paintings. I, I don't feel important. I, I feel a lot of affection in Colombia because I said before, you know, some people sometimes in the street stop me there and say, Oh, I love your work, or, or this and that, and you are doing something wonderful. Well, you know, that's a, a great communication at a level sometimes of very poor or very humble people. That gives me a tremendous satisfaction. Uh, in that sense, I can say that, that I felt very rewarded by this affection and love that I feel of the people of Colombia, yes. I, uh, there's one yeah, near the um, What are your thoughts on the work of Salvador What are your thoughts on the work of Salvador Dali, and did his work influence you at all? Well, uh, Dali is one of the painters I hate the most. I talk of Sorry, no. No, Dali. No, Dali for me. Uh, hi. Um, do you follow any any contemporary artists right now? Someone that you admire now in uh, nowadays uh, alive artists? Are there any contemporary artists working today whose work you admire? Well, I yes, I did uh, see some of the. English artists of today, our back, and some of them, uh, and also German, German like Baselitz, well, uh, some that uh, I think there are people that is still paint. You see, this is very important. People that take a brush, a canvas, and do something and try to say something different. You know, because this is you cannot replace 
But like I did now, that they're replacing the art of painting by a video that has much more to do with uh, television or cinema or with the installation that has to do more with the theater or whatever, you know, or architecture. No, the artist, the, the plastic art are still the thing, you know. The important thing is to say in a flat surface something different, something, something that is not have, not have been seen before. And this is a great problem, very difficult, you know, not every other subject, but that's the, the essence of the problem of being an artist, to create something different in that flat surface. Mm -hmm. Then you see, this is, uh, this is the purpose that I try to, to, to that's what I'm trying to do. This could be part of the question. <laughs> if there were any contemporary artists who you <laughs> oh, admire. Oh, yeah, no, yes. Yeah. No, I, I'm going back to the question. I like some of the artists that they still work with the, the traditional way, with brushes and canvas, and they are involved with this, and they love this smell of turpentine. Very mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. And the, another question is here. painting. How do you think that your photos compare to the photos we've seen of torture in the modern day media? What was the message that you were trying to get across compared to a photograph? Um, the question is what, what were you trying to do with the Abu Ghraib series? How does that compare with the photographs of the event that came out? Well, in a way, some people told me that they felt more what happened in Abu Ghraib with my painters with the photos. Of course, I have to see the photos in order to, to know the atmosphere where this drama was happening, this corridor that I use in all, all my paintings. But of course, there were no actual photos or very few of the actual torture, you know? And then I tried to recreate through the, uh, what I was reading in the paper, not inventing anything, you know? I, uh, I was reading in the, in the New York Times, etc. what was happening, and I was trying to visualize, like in art, you always do like, like, like that, you know? It's, is you have to make visible what is invisible. Mm -hmm. And then uh, that's the way I did it, you know, uh, trying to recreate uh, what hap what's happening in this prison. Trying to make visible what did yeah. not appear in the yeah. photos. We have time for one, one more? One more. Oh. We have time for two more. Um, this will be a short on question. The left, there's a question over here on, on the side. Can someone take the uh, mic? Uh, oh, I'm right wondering, there. I mean, you've obviously in your whole life and career as a painter followed your own vision and with your own style and very much outside of the canon of, of you know, New York art. And, and I feel that there's an incredible affinity that I see in your work toward to literature of South America, of Borges, even Bolaños, you know, I mean, there, there are, uh, and I'm wondering if, if that's been an influence uh, to you, if, if these authors uh, have influenced the way you see the world. What is the relationship between your painting and the work of um, Latin American novelists, writers? Well, you know, it's very difficult to get inspired by, by a text, you see. You know, you, in the reality of Latin America, you see it as a writer or as a painter, you see. You can read all the novels that you can, that you want, and you will never can produce a painting, you know. It's something completely different. It is like, like music and painting and architecture and painting, and it's every art has its essence, and you cannot pass one thing to, to, to another, you see. I, of course, I love, like everybody else, uh, what is going on in, in Latin America in literature. It's fantastic. But uh, sometimes it's uh, rural, rural, sometimes it's uh, of the towns. But I cannot, I mean, it's, the composition is a composition. It's, it's something that you have to, you have to think in terms of colors and forms, and this and that. And it's not uh, possible to pass the essence of one art to the other. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Botero. Uh, you have been painting for a long time, and when we see many artists, they, they seem to have very precise periods at which they really paint a much better quality than others. Do you feel over time that your painting it, it gets better, or you, there are periods that you feel that 
you, 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 you achieved more or you felt better with your paintings? Or how, how, how do you, as an artist, because sometimes people that see the art see it very differently. Do you feel that there have been periods within your art where you've painted better? And well, uh, uh, yeah. do you, or do you feel that your art has progressively been getting better? Well, uh, well it's getting better in, the, in a way, you know, that I have more precise ideas about what I want to do. You see, then it gives more coherence to the painting, you know, because maturity is coherence. You know, in which every brush stroke correspond, correspond to your idea of art. You know, in the beginning you are kind of contaminated, <laughs> contaminated by different influences. Then you see it's very difficult to, to keep clean. But at a certain moment you so kind of just go by yourself completely and you don't feel you don't think don't, don't think about anybody else. You know, you are doing about your work and you absorb you completely. I have the feeling now that I'm in that period of my life in which I, I obey only my rules, my beliefs, and uh, it disconnected with everybody else. But you know, of course, it's, for me, it's very difficult to, to judge myself completely, but anyway, that's the feeling. At least what my, my aspiration is that, that total coherence, total independence of what is, has been done before, because art is doing the same, but a different way, you know. My circus painting, for instance, is not the circus that did Picasso, it's the circus that did Lautrec, you know, it's my circus. You see, and then in that sense it's coherent and it's different. Uh, then in that sense is I feel like I am making progress. But of course, you know, you, to judge yourself is not always exact, yes. One more, one more question, <laughs> I think we have. What do you see in your future? What do you see? What are you looking at in your future? As a what do you see in your future? In the future, I'm 81. <laughs> <laughs> I see it black. I see black. <laughs> <laughs> you don't prognosticate. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we finish that. Thank you okay, very thank much. You. Thank you.